Welcome to This Week from Blue Mountain Broadcasting. I'm your host, Linnell Ellis, and I'm delighted that you're joining me today. I'm going to be talking with Megan DeBold from the Blue Zones Project, so you'll want to stay tuned for that interview and some of the latest updates with that project and that initiative. And also, I have really exciting things to share with you about programs coming to Blue Mountain Television, so stay by till the station news segment. Right now, though, let's begin with our devotional thought. You know, we are in January, but actually, if you're really going by the church calendar, this is still part of the 12 days of Christmas, which just begin on December 25 and end on January 6. January 6 being what we call Epiphany, or in many cultures, the Three Kings Day, or El Dia de los Reyes. And uh, it's the day of gift giving, January 6, and the day of thinking about the wise men who came to the baby Jesus and gave their gifts. And so I thought it would be appropriate today to think about the wise men for a few minutes and their, their role in this story and also what we can learn from the story of the wise men. And I'm gonna be sharing with you a devotional from tellingthetruth.org, which is an online ministry. Much legend and tradition surrounds the story of the wise men. We're told that there were three wise men, that they were kings, that they came from the Orient, and that they found Jesus in the manger. But none of this is clear from the account in Scripture. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. On coming to the house, they saw the child and his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And that's from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 2 and verse 11. The biblical account in Matthew 2 doesn't tell us how many there were or that they were kings. The text says they were magi, wise men, literally meaning astronomers, astrologers, or philosophers. They came from the East, but nowhere does the Bible tell us that they came from the Orient, at least not what we think of as the Orient. And contrary to our Christmas pageants, the scriptures don't tell us the wise men found Jesus when he was still in the manger. In all probability, they didn't see Jesus until he was about two years old. Though many elements of the wise men's story that have grown out of tradition and of lack of information, they who came from far laid their gifts at the feet of Jesus, and they still have much to teach us. They were true Jesus seekers. So let's take a look at what may have motivated their journey. The wise men were probably astrologers or astronomers, men highly respected for their wisdom. And astrology is based on the idea that the movement of the stars powerfully influences the affairs of humanity. And those who hold such beliefs spend a great deal of time trying to understand the stellar movements in the heavens and what they might mean for life here on earth. These men who were probably descendants of the soothsayers in Daniel's time, and for reference you might check Daniel chapter 2 verse 2, studied the stars to discover truth. They wanted to know something of the hidden inner workings of the universe. However, beyond their curiosity, these men already had some knowledge of the truth. In part, that knowledge probably came through the Jews who, in their historic captivities in Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon, had left many pieces of information concerning the scriptures. These men not only had access to these insights of astronomy and philosophy, but to the vast riches of the Old Testament as well. And this is why the Magi, presumably from Babylon, went to considerable trouble to find the one who would be born king of the Jews. What could have possibly motivated the interest of the Magi? We know the Magi advised kings in those days, and the birth of, the, of, the, of a new king would at least have been of some political interest to them. But they seem to be driven by more than political concerns. Something more significant was motivating their inquiry. 
And even though they engaged in astrology, which the Lord had strictly forbidden his, pe his people to be involved in, God still used their faulty understanding to lead them to the truth. Likewise, contemporary American culture exhibits a great interest in spiritual matters of all sorts. But when you explore that spirituality, you find people all over the map. It's not traditional or historic spirituality, at least not the kind one would expect in a country with a Judeo-Christian heritage. We have many nominal Christians inside and outside the church whose understanding of Christianity is mixed with all kinds of mysticism and new age thinking, a synthesis of mutually contradictory teachings. But even though they may be seeking spiritual truth where the truth cannot be found, it seems God works in those with spiritual hunger. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. Acts 17, 26 and 27. We must be able to communicate the gospel to the spiritually hungry, no matter what kind of spirituality they're into. People wander winding paths of spirituality because they are looking for the truth. They're looking for Christ, but they may not know it yet. The wise men were looking for some kind of king, but they certainly didn't understand the true nature of the mission of the Christ child. Until we understand seekers, we won't be very effective in building bridges between them and Christ. Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Matthew 2, 2 through 3. Imagine arriving at your destination after two long years of travel only to have things fall apart. That's what happened when the Magi came to King Herod asking the one, about the one who has been born the King of the Jews. Herod was frightened and called together the wise men of Jerusalem to find out where the Messiah was to be born. He then secretly met with the Magi under the pretense of sharing their concern for the search. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, as soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him, Matthew 2, 8. But Herod had no such intentions. He was a paranoid, power hungry murderer. He had no qualms about killing members of his own family. What he really wanted was to exterminate the possibility of this new king's arrival. The wise men went to the right place and asked the right questions, but they were probably disappointed with the answer. He's not here, but they didn't relent. They had come this far and they weren't giving up now. How easily have you been put off in your search? It's interesting to hear the reasons people give for ending their search. One person says they went to church but because they couldn't understand the sermon, they didn't go back again. Another person says, they heard about someone's uncle who ran off with the worship director, and that's reason enough not to go to any church anymore. If we're serious about searching for God, we won't let anything get in our way. A genuine quest for God involves a lot of looking, reading, listening and praying. If we're diligent in our search and ask honest questions, God will reveal himself to us regardless of where we're coming from. And here's a prayer. Dear God, I've been searching for answers. I believe you sent your son into the world to bring glorious gifts of joy and meaning to people like me. It's hard to imagine such grace on my behalf, but you are a God of unbounded resources and unshakable plans. 
And so, Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life and establish your throne. I'm excited about the possibilities because there is no end to your power and love. Thank you for what you will do. Amen. Stay tuned, I'll be right back. Welcome back. Joining me now is Megan DeBolt, Executive Director of the Blue Zones Project. And that's for our area right here in the Walla Walla Valley. It is, yeah, right here in Walla Walla College Place. So yeah. thanks for having me again. So I think most people probably know about Blue Zones already, but maybe just a little refresher for those who um, don't or need to hear again. Of course, yeah, you know, I think that something that's interesting about Blue Zones Project is that some people know a lot about it and some people will still come up to us and say, what is this thing that y'all are doing? And so Blue Zones Project is a community well-being initiative. Um, we started back in, oh gosh, November of 2020, right in the middle of the pandemic. Yes. And um, so we've been going now for just over two years. Um, and we are a three and a half year project. Um, so we're, we're actually an initiative, like what I said, a community well-being initiative. So mm -hmm. our whole focus is on making healthy choices easier here in the Walla Walla Valley, specifically focusing our efforts in Walla Walla and College Place. But the goal is that for those efforts to spill into the broader valley um, organically, as most things do here mm -hmm. in Walla Walla because it's so collaborative. And we've heard mm -hmm. of Blue Zones because there's been some you know, well-known books, documentaries yeah. about the Blue Zones. Yeah, about the, the Blue Zones. And so um, the original research for of the, the on the Blue Zones was by Dan Butner, a National Geographic fellow. And he went around to communities across the globe to try to find areas that, you know, people live long, healthy, happy lives. Yes. Um, and he found five. Um, and how it ended up that they became Blue Zones was that he had a blue marker or that they had a blue marker and they circled them with a blue marker. So it has no other reason to be called Blue Zones other than they had a blue marker at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but what they did from those communities is what they really wanted to find out what, you know, what was the secret sauce that these communities had for people to live long, healthy, happy lives. Yes. And one of those communities is actually Loma Linda, California. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so what they did is they went into those communities and did a lot of research, you know, on their lifestyle and culture. All of the communities were very different in terms of geography and demographics demographics and so it was kind of a melting pot mm -hmm. you know there was no one community alike and so really what they found though were nine common lifestyle characteristics amongst these communities that then we take those lifestyle characteristics and try to kind of bake them back into the fabric of American culture, which yes. some of them are, are missing. You know, the, the lifestyle characteristics really focus on moving naturally. So, mm -hmm. so moving naturally throughout your day, eating healthy, you yes. know, just eating a healthy diet, um, having strong social connections and community, mm -hmm. and having a strong sense of purpose and reason to get up in the morning. And, um, you know, American culture isn't necessarily conducive to those kind yeah, of Yeah, because interestingly, of those five in the world that were originally found, only one of them was yeah. in North America. Exactly, so, yeah, Loma yeah. Linda, California. It's the only one yeah. that's American culture. You know, the mm -hmm. others were in, you know, o Okinawa, Japan, Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica, um, Sardinia, Italy, yes. um, and so, in Icaria, Greece. Yes. And so, really, it's been, it's been really, interesting and a fun challenge to to do the wor that work here in the Walla Walla Valley because, you know, something that b before I joined Blue Zones Project, I was with um, the public health department here in the mm -hmm. county and I was part of the group who actually was trying to bring Blue Zones Project to the Walla Walla Valley because yeah. um, we knew that this was just a perfect spot for it. And we knew it was because we have all we the have ingredients. We have all those elements. We, we have do. all those elements. We just haven't necessarily figured out until with Blue Zones Project, we plan to bring the recipe to put it all together um, and really lead the community forward in a to, towards a shared vision for mm -hmm. the community and mm -hmm. it's been a lot of it's been a lot of fun a lot of hard work and what's really wonderful about Blue Zones Project because we aren't an ongoing project um, our goal you know is to reach kind of a tipping point for well-being transformation by the end of April 2024 that'll That's be the end of, of our project up. it's a year and a couple months away yes, yes. Um, now that it's 2023 um, but to to really the everything that we do with Blue Zones Project we do it with 
community partners so that we never do anything by ourselves mm -hmm. because that isn't sustainable. That won't produce long lasting yes. well being transformation. And so everything we do is with community partners, whether it's city governments or county governments, you know, school districts, universities, um, you know, restaurants, grocery stores, mm -hmm. uh, all those non the non the vast nonprofit community that we have here in Walla Walla. And so it's been a lot of fun yeah. to get to engage um, with the partners here in Walla Walla and College Place. And Blue Zones Project is launching something brand new right here at the beginning of the year. Yeah, so um, so what we're getting ready, or what we're, we just launched today, is what's called our Community Wellbeing Assessment. And so mm. when we first started Blue Zones Project in, um, in 2020, we got a community baseline um, with the same survey tool. The survey tool is called the Real Age Test. Um, but really, we got that baseline for health and well-being to kind of determine where where do we need to focus? Like, what what's the baseline? And mm -hmm. also to be able to determine if we're making any improvements over this three-year period yes. that we're doing this really intensive, like, community well-being Okay, work. so you, you conducted the survey at the very beginning. I did, and okay. I didn't tell you earlier. Um, so yeah, so we've conducted the survey at the very beginning in February of 2021, actually. Mm -hmm. And so now we're doing it again midway through the project. Ah. And so we're going to be doing, we're doing this community well-being um, assessment, and it's called, the survey tool we use is called the Real Age Test. Um, and it's on our website and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but um, but we're asking the communi community members. I'm pretty sure members, I took that test back in maybe. February of 21. Yeah, so yeah. again, you like what your mm -hmm. real age is after yes. you took so many. Mm -hmm. Ideally, your real age would be younger, possibly, than, you than really your are. chronological yeah. age. Yeah. But sometimes it's not. And mm -hmm. But what's really cool about the real age test is that not only does it give us and our, and our partners data on the community, you know, non-personalized data, sure. but it also gives the individual taking the test really valuable health insights. Yes, it's like I remember getting back a few tips, like you could improve your real age by, you know, exactly. here's the areas you could work on. I know mine were like sleep more mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and and walk more and eat more fruits and vegetables and maybe- Mine was like, lose a little weight. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so it's, it's really nice because a lot of the times when you take a health assessment or something like that, you don't actually get back data for yourself, mm -hmm. you know, or tips for yourself. And so what's really cool about the Real Age Test is that it gives you back data and information on how you can make improvements to your own health and well-being, including financial health yes. and, and things like that. It's not just your physical yeah, health. Yeah, things that bring stress in exactly. your life. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But it also gives us information on the community and where our community's at to kind of be able to fine tune our efforts to mm -hmm. make sure that they're, they're um, really impactful for what the Walla Walla Valley needs. Okay, so uh, how, how does the assessment take place then? How do people participate? Yeah, so um, the, the assessment, it's an online assessment, mm -hmm. um, and it's at bzpwallawallavalley.sharecare.com. We'll have the website available. Yes, um, it's it's long, um, but um, but the, uh, also so that's that's you can go to the, go to the website and it's a, it takes about fifteen minutes mm -hmm. to take the survey. It's not necessarily short, um, but you know it'll ask you general questions. You know on your your height and weight and yeah. how much how many nights do you get? You know seven or more hours of sleep. How much do you you know how many you know alcoholic beverages do you have on a in a daily basis mm -hmm. or weekly basis? How mm -hmm. much you know fruit and vegetables do you consume, whole grains, but also things about, you know, how many, you know, close friends do you have, yes. you know, about the social relationships that are really important too, you know, or do mm -hmm. you feel proud of the community that you live in? Yeah. Those are things that are really important to our government leaders here in the Walla Walla Valley. Sure. And so, um, so it's a really useful survey, not just to us at Blue Zones Project, but to our whole community, which is really valuable. Mm -hmm. We're also sent, they also sent out a number of paper surveys. Um, we our, our operating partner is called ShareCare, yes. and they partner with an, uh, Boston University. And so Boston University also sent out upwards of 2,000 paper surveys mm -hmm. as well. So if you get a paper survey, it'll have a dollar bill. That's a carrot to guilt you into taking the survey. <laughs> um, but please do take the survey. It doesn't, it really doesn't take too long. Um, and, uh, and send that survey back in so that we can get um, some good information to be able to base our, our pretty much our last year of sure. the project on. And I'm, I'm assuming that you're hoping as these surveys come back that you can actually see that there's been some improvement 
Hopefully. some moving toward the ideals of being a blue zone community. Exactly. Yes, yeah. that's our that's our goal. Is that we're we're trying to get to that kind of tipping point that at least you know twenty five or five to twenty five percent of our community has engaged and is starting to see um, well being improvement. Well, I feel like Blue Zones Project has done a great job of showing up all oh. over the community because lots of places that I go, you're there or your associates mm -hmm. or you know someone's there talking about this initiative or that initiative or or cooking a recipe for me in the park during the summer or you know it, it's just uh, I feel like it's present, like we know about it. Yeah, we've we've really been lucky um, that we have such strong community partners to uh, who have invited us or who have who have brought us along with them to share the message of well-being. Mm -hmm. You know, so whether it's the city of College Place and being down at the farmers markets in the summer doing cooking classes, or you know, it's the the library, the Walla Walla Public Library. We did um, online cooking classes with them. We're going to be doing um, a lot of cooking classes. Um, over the the next few months, mm -hmm. um, the first quarter of the year is actually kind of really focused on eating wisely, mm -hmm. and so we're going to do a lot of um, we cooking all need classes that after and the holidays when we didn't eat wisely. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so, so it's you know we right now um, in the winter kind of events are slower, you know. Yes. But we like, try to do a lot of programming with we do a lot of programming with the work sites that we engage with, um, mm -hmm. and um, as with schools. Um, so those, the parents and, and um, employees of some of the work sites that we're working with will see us a lot in yes. those places. Um, and then we do have other programming going on just for the general community as well. And you can access all of that on our website through our events page. Okay, that's good because yeah. I know there there are classes you can take and mm -hmm. uh, there's just a lot there, there that is. you can get as involved as you want to, really. You definitely can. I think it's, um, you know, whether it's directly with Blue Zones Project or one of the organizations that we partner with, you know, mm -hmm. one thing that we're really trying to get people to to continue to do here in the Walla Valley is volunteer. You know, the gift of your time is, you know, immeasurable, you know, and so to get people to volunteer and not necessarily with Blue Zones Project, but with Christian Aid Society or Children's Home Society yes. or with the Volunteer Corps or, you know, with the Sleep Center, you know, somewhere where they really do need volunteer time. And so um, so we're trying to, to really bolster the spirit of volunteerism here in the Valley. And we partner a lot actually with the Center for Humanitarian Engagement here at Walwell University and David Lopez and his team to, yes. to encourage that as well. Another so, great organization another great <laughs> in our organization, community. Definitely. Uh, well, this this has just been fantastic to hear the update, to hear more about what's happening with Blue Zones. I know yeah. lots of people in our community are excited about it. So thank you, Megan. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Linnell, for having me. And stay tuned. I'll be right back with Station News. Welcome back. It's time for Station News, and I have a lot to tell you, so I might speak kind of quickly here. First of all, you have been waiting, I'm sure, to hear how much came in through the Valley Giving Guide. So for Blue Mountain Television, $56,590 came in from November 29 through December 31. Thank you so much, and we're praising God for the wonderful outpouring, and that is more than last year. So just exciting to hear that total. And here's another number that's more than last year, 49 individual donors who contributed through the Valley Giving Guide, almost 50. So that's very exciting for us as well. Thank you. And uh, I promised you that I would tell you about some new programs that are coming up. You've got to hear about this. Um, this one's not the most important one, but we're adding one airing of the of this show that you're watching right now. So that's going to be coming Wednesday evenings at 9 p.m. So there's another opportunity to see it. But here's what I really wanted to tell you. This is the one that's making me so excited. Thunder in the Holy Land. Have you heard of that show? It's a really great program with segments of it recorded in the Holy Land. It's very exciting and dynamic, and we have a local host for that show, Pastor James Ash from the State Line Seventh-day Adventist Church, and he is the host of Thunder in the Holy Land that you're going to be able to see now on Blue Mountain Television, Sundays at 9 p.m., mark this down, Tuesdays at 5 p.m., Wednesdays at 7.30 a.m., Fridays at 5.30 p.m., and Saturdays at 7.30 a.m. So lots of opportunities to see this great new show on Blue Mountain Television, hosted by our local pastor, James Ash. And 
for you kids who are watching or parents or grandparents who want to tell your children about this brand new kids program. We always love to bring something new for children. It's called King's Kids. And you can see this show at the same time every day, Monday through Thursday, 4 p.m. So mark your calendar for that, 4 p.m. Monday through Thursday for King's Kids. Here's a little description of the program. An engaging and interactive, interactive show with songs and videos with puppets and kids that are teaching that Jesus loves us and wants to be our best friend. I got to see a little clip of it a few days ago and it looks great. Looks really fun. Um, if I was a kid, I'd want to be watching it. If my kids were still small, I would definitely be showing it to them. And one more. Uh, this has already been on the air a little bit, and it's a very, very popular, sh uh, I think it has. I haven't watched it on air yet. I've watched it when Lowell showed it to me, but um, not actually on air. Conversations with John Bradshaw, and we're now adding Friday nights at 7 p.m for that program. And this is a great show that really hears about people's stories, their testimonies. How's God been working in their lives? I think you're, you're going to love it if you haven't already been tuning in for that one. So Friday nights at 7 p.m. And uh, two more quick things I want to tell you about, not related to programming directly. One of them is that you can now watch Blue Mountain Television in high definition on Charter in all of our viewing areas. We had announced that one or two had come on in high definition. Now all of them are available in high definition on channel 779 with Charter Cable. You can also still watch it in standard definition on channel 179. So um, if you've been watching on 179, you might want to switch over to watching it on 779 so that you can see it in high definition, just a more beautiful picture uh, that we are able to bring you. And also, we have been needing some production help here at Blue Mountain Television. Lowell needs someone to work with him. And we have just hired a production intern, Alex Mercia, and we are just really delighted to welcome him to the team. I'll try to get him on the show before too long if he's willing so that you can meet him and find out a little bit about Alex. But he's a graduate of Walla Walla University, and we're so delighted that he is bringing his skills at editing and post-production to Blue Mountain Television. Well, I want to thank you for what you do for the station. Uh, we still need some emergency funds um, in our SOS appeal that we've made as we are trying to move our equipment over to our Wallula facility. So I know some of you have been giving special gifts to that. We welcome additional gifts to that project and also for our operating budget and uh, anything that you are able to do to help us as we are definitely moving forward here at Blue Mountain Television's ministry. So thank you for your prayers, your gifts, telling other people about the great shows on the program. And thanks for taking a few minutes out of your busy day to spend some time with me on this show. I really appreciate it. I'll see you next time.